Welcome back. This is lecture 22, the Romanesque style in the Holy Roman Empire. So just as a reminder, we had looked during the era of Charlemagne at the full extent of the Holy Roman Empire. Remember, it included quite a bit of Italy, most of modern day France and Germany. By the time the Ottonians uh, are the leaders of the Holy Roman Empire. It is a much smaller uh, territory. It does not include the majority of France. So we've already looked at France separately. We're now looking at uh, the Holy Roman Empire uh, during the Romanesque era. And so the architectural style is somewhat similar. You're gonna see a fair amount of influence in Germany of the Italian style and vice versa. We definitely know about the transition over time from the peripteral temple to the basilica to the Christian cathedrals. And of course, really main things remember of course is the addition of the transverse aisle or the transept the uh, side aisles that lead to the ambulatory around the apse to the radiating chapels but really paying attention to that crossing shape and to the decorative uh, opportunity there at the crossing quite often a tower can be placed in that space we also know again sitting in the nave instead of face over to the apse or the altar looking at the side we can see the divisions of the side wall of the church the separation from the nave from the aisle is the nave arcade above which if there is one maybe a gallery uh, a second story level you could lean out and look into the nave decorative level of the triforium and the area where the windows are the clear story or clerestory we certainly have seen the use of the rounded arch throughout the romanesque we will see far more of the groin vaulting being used particularly in the bays within the nave here in the examples of architecture from the Holy Roman Empire during the Romanesque era. We know that when two barrel vaults cross at a 90 degree angle, it creates a groin vault four part uh, division. We can also create groin vaulting that gives us a six part division. You see that at the bottom right. The Romanesque style for sure, we've had the round arches and what we call transverse arches that would be an arch straight across from one piece to the other, directly across from it we are usually going to see uh, nave elevation in romanesque churches being two or three levels always the nave arcade and then either the tribune possibly a triforium or a tribune and then a clerestory notice that we don't have clerestories in some of them so usually it's two or three levels the groin vaulting allows us to create something a little different than the transverse arch here we've got a transverse arch we're now going to start having uh diagonal uh crossings and those diagonal crossings create the line that looks like an x so a diagonal vaulted uh, crossing diagonal crossing will be an X shape the transverse will be straight across we know about the bay being the unit between two columns so when we look up at the vaulting within one bay unit we can tell whether it's four part or six part here you've got your diagonal that's formed by the groin of the two barrel vaults crossing one another you can see that a transverse would be straight across from one uh, pier straight across the bay to the other pier the webbing is what we refer to as the stonework the masonry in between the ribs so the ribs are going to become more and more evident we've seen a fair amount of rib work just in straight across romanesque style here we're going to start to see it now on the diagonal and that's certainly becoming more evident when we look at churches that have more elaborate bay aspects so here we are now in germany and you can see continuing some of the tradition of the Carolingian. We still have that pretty prominent uh, westward. It still is a very imposing um, castle-like frontage to this church. Not an enormous tower over the crossing, but a good dome structure. And we certainly see that the uh, transverse 
arch. The crossing aisle is not as uh, extensive as we've seen in some of the examples in France. It doesn't extend far beyond the side aisles. Just uh, since this is one of the churches to know for the test, I want us to have a little bit better uh, glimpse at it. So again, let me take you to a three-dimensional view. Okay, so here we are within the cathedral fire, and I wanted you to be able to see all the way around how massive these pillars are that are holding up the roof. But you notice that they alternate from square pillars and gate columns to more elaborate, larger engaged columns we call compound piers. And if we look up the length of these, we can see how the decorative element continues. It's much more elaborate on the compound pier than on the engaged column pier beside it. And notice that the compound pier has ribbing straight across. There's our transverse ribbing. But notice that within the bay of the nave, between two sets of columns, we actually have a slight rib. It's not terribly articulated, but you can see that there are four parts here. This is a four-part quatripartite ribbing system, and it's definitely different from what we've seen so far in France. You can see it allows the church to be much, much taller, and it also distributes some of the weight onto these piers so we can pierce the side there with more windows. So this is a rather unique elevation as well. We have the nave arcade that separates just the side aisle. No gallery, but the window level, the clerestory right there. Pretty impressive height and decorative quality here in the style of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. So Spire Cathedral, a couple distinguishing features to help. We have uh, unvaulted nave with quadripartite vaults, round transverse arches across each end of each bay, and there's a dome over our crossing section as opposed to a tower. So it should be pretty easy to recognize this one as being different from French Romanesque. Here is another very different example. This one is from Italy. This is in Milan. Uh, remember that Charlemagne had conquered the northern portion of the Italian peninsula known as Lombardy. Uh, and so there's a, quite a bit of feedback style-wise between the Lombard region of Italy and Germany proper. So here we see in the bay that we have four sections, one, two, three, four. They're quite large ribs that go not just on the transverse here, but on the diagonal. So you can really see an elaborate amount of stonework here creating these really vaulted ceilings. This is another one of those unusual uh, design features. It's somewhat similar to the very earliest Romanesque in that the crossing aisle is the same width as the side aisle, so it doesn't stick out from the sides of the church itself, which allows us to put these apses on the ends of our uh, side aisles, creating that kind of stair step effect when viewed from above. The illuminated manuscripts from Germany are, of course, very similar to some of the things that we've seen up till now uh, in the traditions of the uh, Carolingian and Antonian, obviously. So we've got quite a bit of the intricate interlacing and the elaboration of initial capitals. 
We see some continuation, though, of that adherence to the Eastern Byzantine style. In this particular set, we have uh, attributed to the abbess Hitna. Hitna was an abbess of an abbey who commissioned these uh, gospel uh, books to be created and oversaw the decoration therein. And so you definitely see um, a continuation, sort of unbroken continuation of that style that has an interest in the art of the uh, Eastern Byzantine Empire. Definitely there's some room for fun in some of these. I included a few examples uh, just to prove that women are still involved in the arts, although we often think of women as not having very major uh, roles in society uh, during times like the Middle Ages. There are definitely a, a handful of women who are able to become quite successful within the church structure, particularly within the scriptoria. So this is uh, an artist working in a scriptoria known to us as Daimoth or Daimudas, a nun in Bavaria who reportedly was responsible for at least 45 manuscripts. There is a self-portrait of her embedded here. Self-portraits not unusual as in this case. This is Guda or Gutta. We've looked at a little bit of her work earlier. But again, that kind of obsession with interlaced decoration and the combination of animal and human forms continues. Probably the most famous, most important female religious figure, maybe in all of Western Europe in uh, the Middle Ages, certainly, is Hildegard of Bingham. And Hildegard was a nun who eventually rose to the position of being an abbess in charge of her own abbey. And she, at around the time that she became the abbess proper, uh, revealed that she had had visions really since her youth um, in which she felt literally touched by fire, the light and power of the word of God entered her in flames straight to her brain. And she then had the complete clarity to understand the intricacies of the Holy Scriptures. And so she was able then to help interpret them for other people. So you actually see her here. She didn't make the artwork. She would have overseen the uh, creation of this book. It is one of the major works that she wrote during her lifetime, which was then uh, copied multiple times over by hand in Scriptoria. The uh, example we're looking at is a facsimile, a recreation based on her original text. But you see the uh, monk that she worked with, he's her scribe. He's literally working for her. So while she's having the vision, literally touched by the fire of heaven, he is taking down every word to preserve it so it can be shared with other people. You can see that she is seated in a very similar way to the images that we've seen, particularly in the Carolingian and Ottonian styles. Uh, when we looked at the gospel books, the uh, gospels of Matthew in particular, writing uh, his book, you see the pose is almost identical here. And again, the reality of the scene is less important than the symbolism. The flames seem to uh, literally enter her eyes and ears, so enter into her brain. But the building that they're in and the architecture is far smaller than the size of the figures. That will persist into the early days of the Renaissance. And also the perspective is quite impossible. There's no way that her scribe could be uh, looking through the window the way it's drawn and have his head in the position that it's in in the room that she's in either. These are other images that are drawn from Hildegard's visions. She not only was a prolific writer, she wrote music. She uh, Many of her songs are still um, in existence. Um, they have been even recorded. She has uh, also a lot of writing on um, practical matters, not just religious matters, but very practical matters like uh, scientific approach to, to health. Um, her medical texts were used throughout the Middle Ages. So she's definitely a force to be reckoned with. Not the only abbess to have some power. This is uh, the abbess of Hohenberg and an 
image from a book that she is responsible for uh, overseeing the creation of, which shows the tortures of the damned in hell. Pretty remarkable example there. There's also room for some fun, though. This is one of my personal favorite examples. This is an image of a woman who's not a nun. She's actually not in a nun's habit. You see her head is not covered. She's got her hair loose. It's hanging down behind her in these plaits. And she is sort of swinging on this ornate medieval design, making her body the tail for the letter Q. So you actually see a little bit of humor here in this particular uh, illustration. We know that we know this book is the Clarissa Psalter because the girl has the name Clarissa written around her head. It's a pretty remarkable object. So definitely there are a lot of um, people involved in the creation of books. It's not only limited to men. Women have their uh, influence there as well. This book is probably the work of a father-daughter team and also probably worked on by their apprentices. And so it shows a contrast. This is something we'll see in the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, this contrast between the living and the dead, between humor and sorrow. You start to see this playing out in Proverbs and illustrations. The Duke of Saxony, later the Duke of Bavaria, Henry the Lion, is the gospel of Henry the Lion made for him. And it shows his uh, crowning his and his wife and the introduction of the books of the four gospels. You can see the gospel symbols there as well. So some of the work that is uh, important, I think, in the tradition of the Holy Roman Empire during the Romanesque is the elaborate metal work and the three-dimensional sculptural work. It is a little bit different from what we've seen um, in France. Here you see an actual baptismal. This shows the, in fairly high relief, shows the baptism of Christ. So some remarkable features include the fact that we have a nude, um, very rare in the Middle Ages. We see figures in multiple poses. In fact, we see figures fully frontal from the side in three-quarter view, and this figure from the Back. And this is one of the most elaborate and remarkably accurate, proportionally uh, accurate set of figural images that we've seen up to this point. So again, remember that here in what's left of the Holy Roman Empire at this point from uh, Germany through Lombardy, we still have a little bit closer connection to those Italian traditions from, um, this is the head of or reliquary head of St. Alexander. And you can see him represented not only in this reprise head, but also here in this portrait as well.